We stand together. So we're continuing on in the theme. We can stand with teachers, we can stand as students, and we can stand as parents. And I want to just focus here on this bit here for a little while. It was just the other day, I think it was September, and I went down to a conference called the National Achievers Conference. And there was one person, my friend and I were really keen to listen to speak. And as of usual, they came on at six o'clock that night. And his name was Sir Richard Branson. Anyone heard of him? He's a very successful businessman. And about the only thing I remembered in the whole entire conference, and I'd been there for, since nine o'clock that morning, was something his parents taught him. And he was being interviewed. In fact, he's quite shy and he really doesn't like to be on stage. And he was on stage in front of uh, probably six, 7,000 people. And so what they did for him is they set it up so they, they had a chair here with an interviewer and he sat in the lounge here. And one of the interviewing questions was, what do you do, Richard, when everything falls apart and you have to address your staff? And he says, well, I always try and see the best in people. And he goes, why do you do that? Where did that come from? And he, then he went and talked about his parents and how his parents had taught him never to speak ill of anyone. Imagine a playground of students that were taught that principle. How did he teach that principle is a really good question. This is what used to happen when it wasn't Sir Richard, it was Little Richard. He, like most kids, and I'm sure you have kids, and even as adults, you know, taming the tongue is a hard thing to do. When he went off for some reason or spoke harshly to anyone, he was asked to go and look in the mirror for about five minutes and, and say to himself, whatever comes out of my mouth is a reflection of me. And he was taught that as he grew, as he grew up. And he's one of the most successful, well-loved people, generous-hearted people possibly in the world. And his parents were key in making that happen. And I think as parents, we're key in counteracting bullying. So how can we do that? One, one thing, continuing along the lines of, of what Kev has been saying, and that is as a person standing alone, you can be attacked and defeated. All you have to do is watch the news to see that happen most nights. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple cord is not easily broken. So in st taking a stand, and I'm not just saying your children taking a stand, but with the parents and the teachers and the children all together, then we have a solution to bullying. If it's just individual, then it's quite difficult to deal with. So I'm going to suggest tonight, there's three virtues that we can teach our children. Three virtues we that will in fact counteract bullying. And the first one, the question I have for you, why is gentleness so important to counteract bullying? Now the reason is, is gentleness is power under control. I've got a funny slide for you so you can remember the word gentleness because the funnier it is, the more likely you'll remember it. And that dog, he's got the power, right? And usually when we have a power imbalance, we can use it for good, we can use it to empower people, to encourage people, or we can use it for harm. And in a bullying situation, it's used for harm. So what is gentleness? Gentleness is a strong hand with a soft touch. It is a tender, compassionate approach towards others' weaknesses and limitations. And in life, we get ourselves in situations where there are power imbalances. And we're sometimes at the mercy of that person. Are they going to use their power in a good way and in a positive way or in a negative way? Within families, there's power imbalances all the time. There's the oldest child, the youngest child. And there's a physical power imbalance. And we've always got opportunities to teach our children. I love this story. There was a corporal and his three men. 
And he had authority over these three men and he had a task for them to do. And he was asking these three men to lift a log that was here and move it about 10 metres over to the fence. And he'd say to them, one, two, three, lift. And he said it again and again and again. But he failed to neglect that those three men were not strong enough to lift that log. And there was a bystander in a big black overcoat and he walked up to the corporal, he looked him in the eyes and he said, why don't you help them? And the corporal kind of stood up straight as if to say, well, I'm the corporal. And so what did the man do? He took off his overcoat, he put it over near the fence, he went over to the log, he said, one, two, three, lift, used his strength, helped the men and he put it over near the fence. He used his power to encourage, to equip, to empower. Does anyone who know who that man is? What his name is? Exactly right. It was the President of the United States. He had every power. He could have gone and yelled at the corporal and told him to go and lift the log by himself. But he modelled gentleness under control. So how do we do that for our children? Well, one te technique you can use is you can use it as a family value. Has anyone here got some family values written up on the wall? So if gentleness is one of your family values, then you can teach it every opportunity. And I don't know about you, but certainly in my family, there's lots of opportunities to teach gentleness under control that power under control. So that's something you can do as parents. Imagine a playground where all the students use their power to help instead of harm. Already, straight away, bullying would be eradicated. Imagine if the teachers, all they had to do is teach. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be awesome? Another virtue that's really important with all the research that I've read, it came up again and again and again. And that is children that are taught empathy within the home are far less likely, if at all, going to bully. And empathy is a really important skill that you can teach your children. Empathy is the experience of understanding another person's condition from their perspective. You place yourself in their shoes and feel what they are feeling. It takes time sometimes to teach this to children. Who here is, have got a child that just naturally oozes empathy? Yeah, there's some. And then who here has got a child that you have to teach it? Quite frequently. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So it can be taught, absolutely. Does anyone know a, a guy by the name of Nick Vorcic? He was born in Australia about 30 plus years ago and he was born with no arms and no legs. And he's actually an activist against bullying. He goes into schools and he talks about the importance of not bullying. And why did he, why does he do that? One, because he's passionate about it, but two, because he knows firsthand what it's like to be bullied. Does anyone remember being 13 years of age? Vaguely, <laughs> I can't really remember. But it's a quite an insecure time. Would that be right? Yes, your body's changing, often it's the onset of pimples, there's all sorts of stuff happening and it's quite an insecure time. And Nick talks about this time where not only was he very different to most of the population of the world, but also he was suffering just the normal puberty stuff that everyone else suffers from and he was quite insecure. And every afternoon before he left, the p left for school, one student would yell out, See ya, Nick. No arms, no legs. Of course, he didn't need to be reminded of that, did he? And it cut him to the core. And so he got so sick of it that eventually one day he summoned the courage. Often we only need three seconds to summon the courage. 
And he stood up to this guy and he looked him straight in the eye and he says, why do you say that? And for the very first time, this kid got it. He realised that it was hurting him. And praise God, it stopped. So he started to understand what it was like to be Nick. He thought it was actually funny. But it wasn't at all funny to Nick. And it, as he realised and got some empathy for Nick, he stopped doing it, which was a great result. So empathy is really, really important. So how do you teach this to your children? I remember when the kids were little, one of the techniques, and I stole it from a psychologist, I can't remember the psychologist's name, and, he used to, and, and the idea was something happened and it was very tangible to say what, child one broke child two's toy. And so I'd sit, I'd sit them down and I'd, and I'd say to them, what's your favourite toy? And they'd tell me what it is and how important it was to them and things like that. And then I'd say, well, imagine if I just got that toy and I just threw it against the wall and it just shattered. How would you feel? And they'd go, oh not very happy and quite sad. Maybe they'd talk about being angry. I'd get them into that emotion, what it would feel like. And then I'd turn it around and I'd say, well, guess how your sister feels right now because you disrespected their toy. And over time, they got it. They got that understanding that I hurt and other people hurt. And that's really what empathy is about. And then I'd ask them, and this is always, never knew what I was going to get after this one. And so, how are you going to make it up to them? And we did that a few times. I even made it up to some teachers every now and again. And it restored the relationship. So, I encourage you to keep teaching empathy within the home setting. Has it, everyone got more than one child? Pretty much? Okay, so you've got lots of opportunity to teach empathy. You've got lots of opportunity to teach gentleness under control. And then finally, the last virtue. Imagine a society that was full of people that had self-discipline. Do you think it would look any different than it does right now? Now, I've got a funny picture for you today because I don't know anyone. Does anyone know how to juggle and have done it, like, just picked it up straight away? Can anyone in the audience juggle? Andy can. I know Andy can. It takes practice, doesn't it? It's not something you can just do it. Self-discipline takes training and practice. And self-discipline is the ability to control one's feelings and overcome one's weaknesses. And I actually believe that self-discipline is a key indicator of success in life. Has anyone heard of the activist Christine Kane? Yeah, so she, she's very proactive in saving girls from the sex slave trade. And she's, she's, very, she's been around a lot of successful people. And she would say, a lot of people think that if you're not successful, it's a talent gap. You're just not talented enough to be successful. But she would say s being successful is a discipline gap. If you want to be successful in, with your kids, in careers, in relationships, it's a discipline gap. And it's really important to take the time to discipline ourselves and teach our children to do it also. So I'm going to go off the mic for a second. How to juggle. So I was at the beach mission. Has everyone been to the beach mission before? Someone has been to the beach mission here. You've been to the beach mission, okay. Someone decided they'd come and teach us how to juggle. And only a few of us really wanted to juggle. And I was one of those few people that really wanted to learn how to juggle. And so in CS the time, we're all meant to have a rest because it's pretty full on beach mission. I'd be sitting there and I'd be throwing balls here, there and everywhere because I couldn't do it straight away. So the first thing you're meant to do is be able to catch one ball like this to there. Like most people could do that. Do you reckon most people could do that? Then the next one, you're meant to cross it over. So that took a bit of practice. And then the third one, you're meant to throw it up 
the middle, kind of. Something like like that. Yeah. Now the key point is not that I know how to juggle. One, it took training, but there's always a stretch when it comes to self-discipline. Can you think of a stretch point your child has? One certain thing? Is there a stretch point that you have? I know some of you in this audience that your stretch point is driving the car. When someone cuts you off, that's a bit of a stretch point from a self-discipline point of view. Has anyone got... You talking about me? Oh, well, I don't know. I, I thought maybe your stretch point might be on the soccer field. Would that be true? Now you're talking about Or your stretch point might be chocolate. But what it does is you need to, to train yourself. So my stretch point is I don't know how to juggle very well four balls. And what happens when I, I, I'm not good at it? And I just throw them away from So the, the point here, though, is that self-discipline is a muscle. And we can build it, and we can teach our children to build it, and we can model it. I mean, if we don't want our children to go off in the playground or speak rudely, then we have to model that. We need to teach self-discipline on a regular basis. And the technique I'd like to share with you here is a Dr. John Irvine technique. Now, he's a local psychologist. He's been around Central Coast for a long time, and he talks about the training principle. He's not a fan of punishment, he's a fan of training. And it kind of goes a bit like this. Now I'm sure this wouldn't happen in your house. So your kids come home from school, they take the backpack off, shove their shoes and they leave them all in the front door and in a mess. That never happened in your house? Okay, so maybe it has. So the, the principle here is that possibly when it's free time, and they're about to sit down to a TV show or something they really like to do. You go, oh, it's time to train. And they look at you go, oh, no. And you teach them. You get them to put their bag on. You get them to take it to their room. You get to take their shoes off. And you do it two or three times. And then before you know it, they're sick of it. Absolutely sick of it. But the next time they come in the door, they generally think about it. It's just like soccer. Not that I'm a huge soccer fan, but if, you, if you're going to be good at soccer, you need to go to training, you need to practice. If you want to raise a self-disciplined child, then we as parents have to invest in the process. Like I invested in learning how to juggle, which is a pretty novel thing to do, not really that important in the scheme of things, but self-discipline for us as parents and for our children is really important in the scheme of things. So... I urge you as parents to be really proactive against bullying by really teaching gentleness, power under control, by teaching empathy, helping children to realise what it's like to be somebody else and to, by teaching self-discipline so that we can have a playground and a schoolyard that is a safe place to be in. <laughs>